Chapter Thirteen of Memoir of Jane Austen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Memoir of Jane Austen by James Edward Austen Lee. Chapter Thirteen, The Last Work. Jane Austen was taken from us. How much unexhausted talent perished with her! How largely she might yet have contributed to the entertainment of her readers, if her life had been prolonged, cannot be known. But it is certain that the mine at which she had so long laboured was not worked out, and that she was still diligently employed in collecting fresh materials from it. Persuasion had been finished in August 1816. Some time was probably given to correcting it for the press, but on the 27th of the following January, according to the date on her own manuscript, she began a new novel, and worked at it up to the 17th of March. The chief part of this manuscript is written in her usual firm and neat hand, but some of the latter pages seem to have been first traced in pencil, probably when she was too weak to sit long at her desk, and written over in ink afterwards. The quantity produced does not indicate any decline of power or industry, for in those seven weeks twelve chapters had been completed. It is more difficult to judge of the quality of a work so little advanced. It had received no name. There was scarcely any indication what the course of the story was to be, nor was any heroine yet perceptible, who, like Fanny Price or Anne Elliot, might draw round her the sympathies of the reader. Such an unfinished fragment cannot be presented to the public, but I am persuaded that some of Jane Austen's admirers will be glad to learn something about the latest creations which were forming themselves in her mind, and therefore, as some of the principal characters were already sketched in with a vigorous hand, I will try to give an idea of them, illustrated by extracts from the work. The scene is laid at Sanditon, a village on the Sussex coast, just struggling into notoriety as a bathing-place, under the patronage of the two principal proprietors of the parish, Mr. Parker and Lady Denham. Mr. Parker was an amiable man, with more enthusiasm than judgment, whose somewhat shallow mind overflowed with the one idea of the prosperity of Sanditon, together with a jealous contempt of the rival village of Brinshore, where a similar attempt was going on. To the regret of his much-enduring wife, he had left his family mansion, with all of its ancestral comforts of gardens, shrubberies, and shelter, situated in a valley some miles inland, and had built a new residence, a Trafalgar house, on the bare brow of the hill overlooking Sanditon, and the sea, exposed to every wind that blows. But he will confess to no discomforts, nor suffer his family to feel any from the change. The following extract brings him before the reader, mounted on his hobby. He wanted to secure the promise of a visit, and to get as many of the family as his own house would hold to follow him to Sanditon as soon as possible, and, healthy as all the Haywoods undeniably were, he foresaw that every one of them would be benefited by the sea. He held it indeed as certain that no person, however upheld for the present by fortuitous aids of exercise and spirit in a semblance of health, could be really in a state of secure and permanent health without spending at least six weeks by the sea every year. The sea air and sea bathing together were nearly infallible, one or the other of them being a match for every disorder of the stomach, the lungs, or the blood. They were antispasmodic, antipulmonary, antibilious, and antirheumatic. Nobody could catch cold by the sea, nobody wanted appetite by the sea, nobody wanted spirits, nobody wanted strength. They were healing, softening, relaxing, fortifying, and bracing, seemingly just as was wanted, sometimes one, sometimes the other. If the sea breeze failed, the sea bath was the certain corrective, and when bathing disagreed, the sea breeze was evidently designed by nature for the cure. His eloquence, however, could not prevail. Mr. and Mrs. Haywood never left home. The maintenance, education, and fitting out of fourteen children demanded a very quiet, settled, careful course of life, and obliged them to be stationary and healthy at Willingdon. What prudence had first enjoined was now rendered pleasant by habit. They never left home, and they had a gratification in saying so. Lady Denham's was a very different character. She was a rich, vulgar widow, with a sharp but narrow mind, who cared for the prosperity of Sanditon only so far as it might increase the value of her own property. She is thus described. Lady Denham had been a rich Miss Brereton, born to wealth, but not to education. 
Her first husband had been a Mr. Hollis, a man of considerable property in the country, of which a large share of the parish of Sanditon, with manor and mansion-house, formed a part. He had been an elderly man when she married him, her own age about thirty. Her motives for such a match could be little understood at the distance of forty years, but she had so well nursed and pleased Mr. Hollis that at his death he left her everything, all his estates, and all at her disposal. After a widowhood of some years she had been induced to marry again. The late Sir Harry Denham, of Denham Park, in the neighbourhood of Sanditon, succeeded in removing her and her large income to his own domains, but he could not succeed in the views of permanently enriching his family which were attributed to him. She had been too wary to put anything out of her own power, and when, on Sir Harry's death, she returned again to her own house at Sanditon, she was said to have made this boast, that though she had got nothing but her title from the family, yet she had given nothing for it. For the title it was to be supposed that she married. Lady Denham was indeed a great lady, beyond the common wants of society, for she had many thousands a year to bequeath, and three distinct sets of people to be courted by, her own relations, who might very reasonably wish for her original thirty pounds among them, the legal heirs of Mr. Hollis, who might hope to be more indebted to her sense of justice than he had allowed them to be to his, and those members of the Denham family for whom her second husband had hoped to make a good bargain. By all these, or by branches of them, she had no doubt been long and still continued to be well attacked, and of these three divisions Mr. Parker did not hesitate to say that Mr. Hollis's kindred were the least in favour, and Sir Henry Denham's the most. The former, he believed, had done themselves irremediable harm by expressions of very unwise resentment at the time of Mr. Hollis's death, the latter, to the advantage of being the remnant of a connection which she had certainly valued, joined those of having been known to her from their childhood, and of being always at hand to pursue their interests by seasonable attentions. But another claimant was now to be taken into account, a young female relation whom Lady Denham had been induced to receive into her family. After having always protested against any such addition, and often enjoyed the repeated defeat she had given to every attempt of her own relations to introduce this young lady, or that young lady, as a companion at Sanditon House, she had brought back with her from London last Michaelmas a Miss Clara Brereton, who bid fair to vie in favour with Sir Edward Denham, and to secure for herself and her family that share of the accumulated property which they certainly had the best right to inherit. Lady Denham's character comes out in a conversation which takes place at Mr. Parker's tea-table. The conversation turned entirely upon Sanditon, its present number of visitants, and the chances of a good season. It was evident that Lady Denham had more anxiety, more fears of loss than her coadjutor. She wanted to have the place fill faster, and seemed to have many harassing apprehensions of the lodgings being in some instances underlet. To report that a large boarding-school was expected, she replies, "'Ah, well, no harm in that. They will stay there six weeks, and out of such a number, who knows, but some may be consumptive, and want asses milk, and I have two milch asses at this very time. But perhaps the little misses may hurt the furniture. I hope they will have a good sharp governess to look after them.' But she wholly disapproved of Mr. Parker's wish to secure the residence of a medical man amongst them. "'Why, what should we do with a doctor here?' It would only be encouraging our servants and the poor to fancy themselves ill, if there was a doctor at hand. Oh, pray let us have none of that tribe at Sanditon. We go on very well as we are. There is the sea, and the downs, and my milch asses, and I have told Mrs. Whitby that if anybody inquires for a chamber-horse, they may be supplied at a fair rate. Poor Mr. Hollis's chamber-horse, as good as new, and what can people want more? I have lived seventy years in the world, and never took physic, except twice, and never saw the face of a doctor in all my life on my own account, and I really believe if my poor dear Sir Harry had never seen one neither, he would have been alive now. Ten fees, one after another, did the men take who sent him out of the world. I beseech you, Mr. Parker, no doctors here. This lady's character comes out more strongly in a conversation with Mr. Parker's guest, Miss Charlotte Haywood. Sir Edward Denham, with his sister Esther, and Clara Brereton have just left them. Charlotte accepted an invitation from Lady Denham to remain with her on the terrace, while the others adjourned to the library. Lady Denham, like a true great lady, talked, and talked only of her own concerns, and Charlotte listened. 
taking hold of Charlotte's arm, with the ease of one who felt that any notice from her was a favour, and, communicative from the same sense of importance, or from a natural love of talking, she immediately said, in a tone of great satisfaction, and with a look of arch sagacity, "'Miss Esther wants me to invite her and her brother to spend a week with me at Sanditon House, as I did last summer, but I shan't. She has been trying to get round me every way with her praise of this and her praise of that, but I saw what she was about. I saw through it all. I am not very easily taken in, my dear.' Charlotte can think of nothing more harmless to be said than the simple inquiry of, "'Sir Edward and Miss Denham?' "'Yes, my dear, my young folks, as I call them, sometimes, for I take them very much by the hand, and had them with me last summer, about this time, for a week, from Monday to Monday, and very delighted and thankful they were. For they are very good young people, my dear. I would not have you think that I only notice them for poor dear Harry's sake. No, no, they are very deserving themselves, or, trust me, they would not be so much in my company. I am not the woman to help anybody blindfold. I always take care to know what I am about, and who I have to deal with, before I stir a finger. I do not think I was ever overreached in my life, and that is a good deal for a woman to say that has been twice married. Poor dear Sir Harry, between ourselves, thought at first to have got more. But, with a bit of a sigh, he is gone, and we must not find fault with the dead. Nobody could live happier together than us, and he was a very honourable man, quite the gentleman, of ancient family, and when he died I gave Sir Edward his gold watch. This was said with a look at her companion, which implied its right to produce a great impression, and seeing no rapturous astonishment on Charlotte's countenance, she added quickly, "'He did not bequeath it to his nephew, my dear. It was no bequest. It was not in the will. He only told me, and that but once, that he should wish his nephew to have his watch, but it need not have been binding if I had not chose it. "'Very kind indeed, very handsome,' said Charlotte, absolutely forced to affect admiration. "'Yes, my dear, and it is not the only kind thing I have done by him. I have been a very liberal friend to Sir Edward, and, poor young man, he needs it bad enough. For though I am only the dowager, my dear, and he is the heir, things do not stand between us in the way they usually do between those two parties. Not a shilling do I receive from the Denham estate. Sir Edward has no payments to make me. He don't stand uppermost, believe me. It is I that help him. Indeed, he is a very fine young man, and particularly elegant in his address. This was said chiefly for the sake of saying something, but Charlotte directly saw that it was laying her open to suspicion, by Lady Denham's giving a shrewd glance at her, and replying, "'Yes, yes, he's very well to look at, and it is to be hoped that somebody of large fortune will think so, for Sir Edward must marry for money. He and I often talk that matter over. A handsome young man like him will go smirking and smiling about, and paying girls compliments, but he knows he must marry for money. And Sir Edward is a very steady young man, in the main, and has got very good notions.' "'Sir Edward Denham,' said Charlotte, "'with such personal advantages, may be almost sure of getting a woman of fortune, if he chooses it.' This glorious sentiment seemed to quite remove suspicion. "'Ay, my dear, that is very sensibly said, and if we could but get a young heiress to Sanditon. But heiresses are monstrous scarce. I do not think we have had an heiress here, nor even a co, since Sanditon has been a public place. Families come after families, but as far as I can learn, it is not one in a hundred of them that have any real property, landed or funded. An income, perhaps, but no property. Clergymen, maybe, or lawyers from town, or half-pay officers, or widows with only a jointure, and what can such people do to anybody, except just as they take our empty houses, and between ourselves I think they are great fools for not staying at home. Now, if we could get a young heiress to be sent here for her health, and as soon as she got well, have her fall in love with Sir Edward— and Miss Esther must marry somebody of fortune, too. She must get a rich husband. Ah, young ladies that have no money are very much to be pitied. After a short pause, if Miss Esther thinks to talk me into inviting them to come and stay at Sanditon House, she will find herself mistaken. Matters are altered with me since last summer, you know. I have Miss Clara with me now, which makes a great difference. I should not choose to have my two housemaids' time taken up all the morning in dusting out bedrooms— they have Miss Clara's room to put to rights, as well as mine, every day. If they had hard work, they would want higher wages. Charlotte's feelings were divided between amusement and indignation. 
She kept her own countenance, and kept a civil silence, but without attempting to listen any longer, and only conscious that Lady Denham was still talking in the same way, allowed her own thoughts to form themselves into such meditation as this. She is thoroughly mean. I had no expectation of anything so bad. Mr. Parker spoke too mildly of her. He is too kind-hearted to see clearly, and their very connection misleads him. He has persuaded her to engage in the same speculation, and because they have so far the same object in view, he fancies that she feels like him in other things, but she is very, very mean. I can see no good in her. Poor Miss Brereton! And it makes everybody mean about her. This poor Sir Edward and his sister, how far nature meant them to be respectable I cannot tell, but they are obliged to be mean in their civility to her, and I am mean, too, in giving her my attention with the appearance of coinciding with her. Thus it is when rich people are sordid. Mr. Parker has two unmarried sisters of singular character. They live together. Diana, the younger, always takes the lead, and the elder follows in the same track. It is their pleasure to fancy themselves invalids to a degree and in a manner never experienced by others, but from a state of exquisite pain and utter prostration, Diana Parker can always rise to be officious in the concerns of all her acquaintance, and to make incredible exertions where they are not wanted. It would seem that they must always be either very busy for the good of others, or else extremely ill themselves. Some natural delicacy of constitution, in fact, with an unfortunate turn for medicine, especially quack medicine, had given them an early tendency at various times to various disorders. The rest of their suffering was from their own fancy, the love of distinction, and the love of the wonderful. They had charitable hearts and many amiable feelings, but a spirit of restless activity, and the glory of doing more than anybody else, had a share in every exertion of benevolence, and there was vanity in all they did, as well as in all they endured. These peculiarities come out in the following letter of Diana Parker to her brother. My dear Tom, we were much grieved at your accident, and if you had not described yourself as having fallen into such very good hands, I should have been with you at all hazards the day after the receipt of your letter, though it found me suffering under a more severe attack than usual of my old grievance, spasmodic bile, and hardly able to crawl from my bed to the sofa. But how were you treated? Send me more particulars in your next. If indeed a simple sprain, as you denominate it, nothing would have been so judicious as friction, friction by the hand alone, supposing it could be applied immediately. Two years ago I happened to be calling on Mrs. Sheldon, when her coachman sprained his foot, as he was cleaning the carriage, and could hardly limp into the house. But by the immediate use of friction alone, steadily persevered in, I rubbed his ankle with my own hands for four hours without intermission. He was well in three days. Pray, never run into peril again, in looking for an apothecary on our account, for had you the most experienced man in his line settled at Sanditon, it would be no recommendation to us. We have entirely done with the whole medical tribe. We have consulted physician after physician in vain, till we are quite convinced that they can do nothing for us, and that we must trust to our knowledge of our own wretched constitutions for any relief. But if you think it advisable for the interests of the place to get a medical man there, I will undertake the commission with pleasure, and have no doubt of succeeding." I could soon put the necessary irons in the fire. As for getting to Sanditon myself, it is an impossibility. I grieve to say that I cannot attempt it, but my feelings tell me too plainly that in my present state the sea air would probably be the death of me, and in truth I doubt whether Susan's nerves would be equal to the effort. She has been suffering much from headache, and six leeches a day, for ten days together, relieved her so little that we thought it right to change our measures and being convinced on examination that much of the evil lay in her gums, I persuaded her to attack the disorder there. She has accordingly had three teeth drawn, and is decidedly better, but her nerves are a good deal deranged, and she can only speak in a whisper, and fainted away this morning on poor Arthur's trying to suppress a cough. Within a week of the date of this letter, in spite of the impossibility of moving, and of the fatal effects to be apprehended from the sea air, Diana Parker was at Sanditon with her sister, she had flattered herself that by her own indefatigable exertions, and by setting at work the agency of many friends, she had induced two large families to take houses at Sanditon. It was to expedite these politic views that she came, and though she met with some disappointment of her expectation, yet she did not suffer in health. 
Such were some of the dramatis personae, already dressed and prepared for their parts. They are at least original and unlike any that the author had produced before. The success of the piece must have depended on the skill with which these parts might be played, but a few will be inclined to distrust the skill of one who had so often succeeded. If the author had lived to complete her work, it is probable that these personages might have grown into as mature an individuality of character, and have taken as permanent a place amongst our familiar acquaintance as Mr. Bennet or John Thorpe, Mary Musgrove or Aunt Norris herself. End of chapter 13